Welcome back to the show. Joining me this week is SEC Commissioner Hester Purse. Hester, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. It's, it's great to be here. I want to start with my standard disclaimer, which is that my views are my own views, not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. Well, what a time to be talking to you. I want to start right off the bat with the big news, the approval of the spot Bitcoin ETFs. It was a long time coming. I want to get your reaction. And in your statement on the day of the approval, you had a few gems that I want to highlight. You said this marks the end of an unnecessary but consequential saga. The commission has driven retail investors to less efficient means of attaining Bitcoin exposure in the securities markets. The commission, rather than admitting error, offers a weak explanation for its change of heart, and we squandered a decade of opportunities to do our job. I would love for you to elaborate on that. Yeah, I mean, I think this expressed frustration that a lot of people felt, which is they were looking at the SEC and seeing, you know, application after application coming in. It seemed that the goalposts were moving. The industry was providing a lot of data. We had seen uh, Bitcoin futures trading now for, for many years. Um, we'd seen similar products trading in other countries for many years. And so it just seemed that nothing was moving forward and nothing did move forward until a court told us it had to. Um, and to me, I look back at that and I see squandered time, not only squandered time on the part of the industry, but also on the part of our staff. Um, what could we have better spent that time doing? And so while I celebrate the moment and the fact that we are now at a place where American investors are able to get access to a Bitcoin exchange traded product, um, which again, you know, it's up to them whether they want to buy it or not, but it, it's the idea that they have access to it. Um, we do have to be a bit reflective and think back on what did we do not right during this process and what can we make sure that we do better the next time do you have any insight into why bitcoin was looked at differently these spot bitcoin etf applications and why it took so long you know this has has perplexed me for many years now um because i look at the standards that we have and i say look if if a product meets the standards it doesn't really matter whether we like the underlying the the innovation with exchange traded products is it brings investors access to a wide range of assets, securities and non-securities through this vehicle, which is a securities vehicle. And that that means that it's easier for them to have in their portfolios, perhaps it's it's it it makes it easier um, for a lot of people to interact with an asset if it's in that wrapper. And so, you know, I, I understand that Bitcoin was a new thing, um, was a new thing. <laughs> And so it took some time for the agency to kind of get its arms around it. But really, that isn't the question that we should be asking when we're approving these exchange traded products. It's about how the product itself will trade. And so I think it's just a bit of fear of the unknown. Is it accurate that Chair Gary Gensler was the deciding vote? Um, he, he seems like he's very pro Bitcoin given his MIT lecture series, but then recently he was just on CNBC saying this is a very speculative asset, mostly used for illicit activity. So I think a lot of people in the community are kind of confused, but was it three well, to two? I mean, I, it was, th sorry for interrupting. It was three to two um, and, and it was Chair Gensler, Commissioner Ueda and I who, who voted in favor of it. Um, I think it's really important, though, for people to to understand that when the SEC approves a product, so say we approve a gold exchange traded product, it doesn't mean that the SEC is telling people you should invest in gold, right? Or if we if if a company is listing its shares in the United States and we we have um, signed off on the on the filings that relate to that that relate to a, an, an initial public offering. It doesn't mean that we're saying that the SEC says this is a good investment for anyone. That's the whole point. The SEC is not a merit regulator. Ultimately, Congress said, SEC, we have a role for you to play in making sure that people get disclosure about the investment products they're buying. But we want it to be up to the American people what they put in their portfolios. We don't want you to micromanage American portfolios. And so when Chair Gensler comes out and says, 
that he has, you know, the, the, the statements that he's made about Bitcoin, um, it shouldn't be surprising. It doesn't, it doesn't ultimately matter what he or I thinks about Bitcoin. What matters is that the product met the legal standards it needed to meet, and therefore it had to go out for trading. And, and ultimately, that was where Chair Gensler got. Um, we, we had the court come in and tell us in the Grayscale case that our reasoning behind denying the Grayscale application was flawed. And that put us in the position where we really had to acknowledge that something that I had, had been worrying about for a long time, that we had been using different standards for different products based on what the underlying was. That just isn't our job. It was such a journey to get here. I know a lot of people are really excited and the week was crazy in and of itself. So I'm not sure what you can share, but I know a lot of people are wondering what happened with the security breach uh, for the SEC's Twitter X page. Is there anything you can share about that? Really nothing that hasn't already been shared publicly by the agency, which is that there was a hack and we're working with law enforcement to get to the bottom of that hack. You know, I think this too is a point where I come back and I say, we didn't have to be in this place where there was so much intense focus on a particular day in January of 2024, because had we just approved these things regular way along the way, there wouldn't have been all this fanfare around, you know, sure, there would have been some attention on a Bitcoin exchange traded product, but the way it was all built up because it had been so long um, it, it led to a moment like that. And, and that's, that's where we never want to be. We never want to create, you know, if, if investors are interested in a product, that's fine. But we never want to be the source of creating a frenzy around a product. Yeah, I've never seen so much anticipation around this type of investment vehicle. Um, it seems like you've been a real champion for Americans' ability to access Bitcoin. And so I was wondering what opportunity do you think Bitcoin represents given the time that we're in? Well, again, I'm not an, I'm not an advocate of any particular asset class. People have to make their own decisions. And if people want to buy Bitcoin, that is something that you know they should be able to do and they should be able to do it directly or they should be able to do it through the securities markets um, if someone wants to offer that product, which clearly people are offering many of those products now. So, but I think that, the, the notion, you know, a lot of people point to crypto and, and they don't understand the point, and that's fine. If they don't understand the point and they don't want to buy it, they don't have to buy it. But for other people, there is um, value to these assets and, and there are um, reasons that people are holding them. We tend to view things through the lens of the United States where we have a stable financial system. You know, people have criti criticisms of the traditional financial system, but relative to, to many countries in the world, we have a stable financial system. But there are other places where people are not blessed with a stable financial system. And if you have a country where you have a hyperinflating currency, you may well decide that you want to go to some some alternative. And I think that's why we've seen um, some some adoption of, of things like Bitcoin or stable coins or, or other People are looking for other, for alternatives to to um, the the currency of their country. So again, I, I think it's not my place to say whether that's a that's a good thing or a bad thing. But I certainly think that there's nothing that should be stopping people who have gotten together and decided we're going to create a way to transfer value across the internet without without having it be tied to any particular country. I, I don't understand why um, that should be a concern for for someone in a in a governmental capacity. I think it's it's just letting people make a decision about what they choose to ascribe value to. Well, members of the SEC, including the chair, have said Bitcoin is not a security. It is a commodity. Um, it, it, they've made it a point to um, highlight that Bitcoin is different from these other cryptocurrencies. Can you share a little bit about that? I mean, why is Bitcoin so different? Because there are still so many legal actions that have to do with a lot of other tokens. Well, again, I think that we have not, not really used a lot of um, legal clarity and a lot of legal precision when we've talked about how we think about whether something fits in the security bucket or not. 
it's actually in the United States, maybe more complicated than it is in, in other places. We, we have a um, definition of what a security is and you, you know, assume that stocks and bonds and things like that fit in. But you can also have something called an investment contract, which gotten a lot of attention in the crypto sphere. That's, that's w why we have the Howey test that came out of a Supreme Court decision to tell us, you know, kind of what the parameters of an, of an investment contract are. But I, I, I think that there's a lot of legal analysis that just hasn't been very precise. You can have an object that is not itself a security that is sold as is sold in a securities transaction as part of an investment contract. So I can sell you any physical object along with promises that I'm going to take care of it for you and it's going to um, it, it's going to rise in value. You don't have to do any work. That could well be a securities transaction when I sell that to you because I'm not only selling you an object, but I'm selling you promises along with it. And it's the same with a digital object. If you take a digital object and you, you, you sell it along with promises, it can turn into a securities transaction. But that doesn't mean that the digital object itself turns into a security. And so I think there's been a lot of, a lot of ambiguity around that coming from the SEC. Um, and there have been a lot of questions that have arisen from that. But so the point is that it does matter how something was originally sold, right? And so that's why some people have looked, how was Bitcoin originally sold to, to answer that question? Was it sold as part of an investment contract? Do you feel that the current law is, is insufficient in determining what is a security in this digital world where we have these different protocols? And do you think there's going to be some sort of digital framework that sort of uh, variates from the 1933 Securities Act? So I wouldn't say that the, the law is insufficient. And I think this is, you know, a point that Congress did get right in the sense that they understood that over time things would change. You needed to have sort of a flexible law. But what I think has changed is that we are asking, um, we're asking for the an ICO, for example, an initial coin offering to be fit within a model that is just not designed for a project that small. And so I put out a safe harbor a number of years ago to say, let's think about what people actually want to get when they're buying these assets. And let's, let's give them that information in a way that makes sense for a project of this size. So I think we could we could use the existing authority we have as the SEC to create something like that. Congress has looked at this issue and they've said, you know what, we think maybe we need a, a whole new framework to deal with these crypto assets because there isn't necessarily a framework that applies to the crypto asset itself. And so if we as a people, as a nation decide, yeah, we want to have we want to have some regulation around crypto assets, around the places where they're sold, around um, disclosures so that people have have disclosures about what's, you know, what what the token economics are and who's behind the project and so forth. Fine, let's figure out a framework that is makes sense, but let's do it in a way that that we remember that crypto is and blockchain are likely not only to be just about financial assets, but around other types of assets that are not necessarily being used for financial purposes. So make sure whatever framework you have acknowledges the fact that these aren't all about finance. So do you feel that Congress will need to sort of come in and take action because there is so much um, ambiguity within the, the SEC and, and sort of create a, a framework for crypto assets and how they're going to be evaluated? Well, I always welcome congressional input. I mean, we we are our job is to administer the law. It's not to make the law. And, and so I always appreciate it when Congress comes in and says, look, we want the SEC to do this. We want the Commodity Futures Trading Commission to do this. We want, you know, another agency to take this piece of it. That is welcome for us because it enables us to really put our heads down and focus on the task that Congress gave us and not worry about things that Congress has said are someone else's job. So, so yeah, I, I welcome congressional input. 
How do you see that happening? I mean, I know this, this year is going to be a crazy one given the election that's coming up. So how do we make progress in this area? Well, I think that we as regulators can be doing some of the legwork and sort of thinking through what are the problems that we're trying to solve here? And, and that, that is sometimes hard work, right? It's, it's sitting down and saying, this technology offers some unique opportunities and some unique challenges. And how can we fit it in with the existing regulatory structure? And where are there maybe gaps where we think we need more regulation? And what would a good regulatory framework look like? Does it look like something like what Europe is doing? Do we have a different take? You know, we can look at what other jurisdictions are are doing. Um, that that work, and then when people come into us and say, "Hey, I really would like to register my token offering," um, we need to work with them to think about what that actually looks like instead of just saying, "Yeah, well, you know, go figure it out and come to us," or go pretend that you're a, a company that's ready to IPO and try to fit into that framework. We need to be willing to sit down and do that hard work with people. It's not that we're going to offer legal counsel to people. That's not our job. But it is our job to say, hey, here's what's really important to us. And let's figure out how we can achieve what's important to us while allowing your business to move forward. I think one thing that you've seen at the SEC, for example, and other regulators is there's been a tendency to say, we don't want you to have any kind of touch with the traditional financial system. So here, obviously, the Bitcoin exchange traded product is, is a, a landmark move because it, it does allow that. But, you know, we sort of send the message to auditors, investment advisors, broker dealers, banks, we don't want you to have any connection with this crypto world. And the consequence of that is that you end up with bad things happening because you say, well, we, we won't let any of the tra traditional actors play the role they play. You actually do want auditors to go in and, and look at whether the reserves are there. That may not look like a traditional audit, and you need to be very careful in outlining the fact that outlining the differences, explaining where the differences are. But I think we should be encouraging people to think of ways to be able to evidence that they have the reserves underlying something that, that you know, they, they claim to have. That seems like a good move, not a bad move. Again, you've got to do it with all the caveats and explain to people where, you know, where the, the weaknesses in an approach are, but you shouldn't stop people altogether from taking from taking steps. Um, and, and I think that is part of what has led us to some of the bad places and the dark places in crypto, which is that um, we have forgotten that there, you know, there, you want to put protections in place. And um, we haven't encouraged the industry to do that. And, and the industry has fallen down too, and, and has forgotten some basic lessons from traditional finance, counterparty risk, Mm -hmm. you know, leverage. These things can yeah. get you in trouble. It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. Next up, Bitcoin 2024, the world's largest Bitcoin conference, is coming to Nashville this year. Come join us for three amazing days of keynotes, panels, networking events, and my Women of Bitcoin brunch. The Bitcoin conference is where I launched my podcast almost three years ago. You never know what can happen or who you can meet here. Head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off. All right, back to the show. Such good points. You know, it's so interesting to follow this. And I focus on Bitcoin, but I have seen within the space sort of these um, these these two stories, one where the crypto exchanges or uh, the people that are behind the d various tokens saying, hey, we're trying to register, or we're trying to come into compliance and the SEC won't talk to us. But then from the SEC side, almost the stance of just come in and register, we're, we're ready to work for work with you. Um, so is it a little bit of both? No, I think the problem is really, look, I mean, they're, they're always going to be bad actors who just are trying to do bad things. And they're, they're, you know, they may be out there complaining about things, but really, they're just trying to do bad things. 
But there are other people who are genuinely trying to figure out how can we meet the regulatory objectives while at the same time having our businesses actually be able to be up and running. And that requires a really robust back and forth between people who are trying to build things and between and the regulator. And you can't come to a regulator who says, I can't help you think through these problems. Um, I'm going to keep you on ice for 10 years while your funding is drying up. You know, there has to be a point at which the regulator says we get that there's something unique here. We Congress gave us exemptive authority. They gave us authority to issue no action letters. We have the ability to make uh, adjustments that make sense. So we have to just use that ability. Um, and so I, I think there have been lots of people who have really genuinely wanted to work with us and have not been able to do that. They've, they've mm -hmm. not been able to get to a productive place. There's no recognition of timing issues, um, the need to move forward. And there's no recognition of some of the unique challenges in this space. And I think that has led us all into a worse place because it's meant that bad actors have really been able to get away with a lot of bad things kind of cloaked in, in uh, the, ambi the regulatory ambiguity. And that's, mm -hmm. that's very problematic. Yeah, we've seen a lot of these um, exchanges operate offshore. A lot of the, even the tokens are based offshore. Circling back to the spot Bitcoin ETF, since there is obviously so much regulatory clarity around one digital asset, which is Bitcoin, with regards to the approvals of all 11 at once, um, was the strategy there so that the SEC is not a kingmaker and there's sort of the, the free market that will decide if, if one ends up being sort of the winning ETF in terms of liquidity? Well, I think speaking for myself personally, I wouldn't. I, I, I think it was a good thing to have have um, multiple go out at once. I, I, you know, you never want the regulatory uh, the regulator to be, as you say, picking which one is going to be the winner. Um, and there had been this has been a long process over ten years. People have been coming in with applications. They've been getting kicked back. People have come in with more data. And so it's really hard to say who was first to the gate. And that's why I think having everyone go out at the same time made a lot of sense. Why was it a sticking point that it would be uh, cash redemptions as opposed to in-kind for Bitcoin? I think that the same standards should apply to Bitcoin exchange traded products as other exchange traded products and, and the in-kind condition uh, the, the cash condition is not one that, that typically applies in, in similar products. Um, what I will say is I think this ties back to a point I was making before, which is there has been a general discomfort at allowing um, regulated entities to be able to interact with Bitcoin. And so I think you saw that, for example, we put out a, a special purpose broker dealer um, order that allows broker dealers to custody digital asset securities, but it specifically does not allow them to custody non-security -digi non digital assets, mm. including Bitcoin, uh, next to digital asset securities. And why does that make sense, right? That seems like an unnecessary condition. And so I think that um, sometimes we just do things differently when it relates to Bitcoin than we than we do when it relates to some other kind of asset. It seems like sometimes you dissent from the rest of the group. Does that ever get awkward at the office? <laughs> Look, I mean, the, the commission is made up of five people for a reason. Um, you want to have five different perspectives. And I come to the job with the view that regulation has a role to play. But we ought to ask and think really carefully before we, we require people to do things differently than they otherwise would have done. That's, you know, that is, is, is not the view that everyone in the U.S. has. It's not the view that all of my colleagues have. And so I think there's value in having um, different voices. Um, so I do enjoy it when we're all on the same page, and we are on most decisions, um, certainly if you look at the enforcement calendar, you'll see that in most 
in most of those decisions, we are unanimous. There are certainly exceptions there too. Um, and there's exceptions on the regulatory side. And as you saw this week, there can be exceptions around something like this. But um, I respect all of my colleagues and I, I, I do enjoy working with them. And I, I hope that sometime I'll be able to convince them um, to change their minds. <laughs> That's well said. Um, I wanted to ask you, what is the public's biggest misconception about the SEC at, that maybe you now have a chance to address? I think one big misconception is that all we do is sit around and think about Bitcoin and, and other crypto assets. And we actually have a ton of stuff going on right now. This is one of the busiest times I've, I've been in, or in and around the SEC for many years now. And this is certainly one of the busiest times for the agency. We are doing a lot of things, most of which have nothing to do with Bitcoin or crypto more broadly. Um, and so it, it is hard for us to take the time to learn about these issues. Um, it is a new area. And so I think people should be patient. Um, as you could tell from my statement, I'm a bit impatient um, about, about the approach that we've taken here. Um, I, I, you know, I think we haven't handled this well. But on the other hand, um, it is true that we're doing lots of things, many of which I also don't agree with, but in any event, it does keep us all busy. Uh, many of the people listening to this show are very passionate about Bitcoin, um, but some of them are not big fans of regulation, and maybe they have a wary stance about uh, the government getting involved in any way and, and about the SEC. What do you say directly to those people? Well, one thing I say is I think all Americans should... Um, always be asking questions. I mean, that's one of the beauties of this country is that we have that we we live in a country where you can criticize your government, you can ask questions of your government, the government works for the people, it does not, it's not the other way around, and we have to maintain that. And so I think it's really important for people to always approach things with skepticism, always ask questions, always push back and assert the need for liberty, because that does define us as a people. And, um, and that is why, as I said, when I think about regulation, my initial, when I think about a problem that we're facing as a country, my initial reaction isn't to say, well, let's look in the regulatory toolbox to see what we can do to fix that. I think it's first that we need to look into the, you know, into society and see, well, is society on its own fixing the problem? We have lots of civil society institutions that can address problems. Um, we have people just working together to build solutions. Um, and maybe the solutions come from the people instead of coming from the government toolbox. And so I do, I do encourage people to keep thinking about non-regulatory solutions because non-regulatory solutions enable people to solve problems without having them force other people to do a particular thing, right? It's a voluntary thing instead of a mandatory. And that there's real value in that. That's not to say that there aren't times where regulation is important. Um, and at those times, we have to sit down and try to work together to develop the best regulations possible. But there are lots of other ways to solve problems than, than through a government regulatory approach. And the other point I would make is that I know as much as some people are celebrating a Bitcoin exchange traded product, there are other people who are saying, well, we don't want to have any link to the traditional financial system at all. This is exactly what we did not want to have. And I understand that perspective too. And I think no one's forcing you to buy your Bitcoin or hold your Bitcoin through an exchange traded product. But again, the liberty principle is really important. There are people for whom these products, they think, they, they think that there is a set of investors who really wants these products. And so if people want those products, again, I think we should be careful not to step in front of those people's access to those products. So I think the, that the liberty principle is one that really underlie, underlies the way I think about a lot of these issues. You know, people should be, should be able to do things that they think are right for themselves and their families we as a government should be loath to step in front of them and say, no, you can't do that. There are times when we have to do that, but we should be very careful. 
That is very sound and very fair. Thank you. I, I did want to ask our members, our people who work at the SEC, are you allowed to hold assets like Bitcoin? Um, look, it's a complicated question. And I, and I will it, generally, if you're working on these issues, the answer is no. OK, there, I, I commend you to other sources. If you want to talk to the ethics people at the SEC, you're welcome to do that. What I will say for myself is that because I've been so actively involved in thinking about these issues, even if the SEC were to tell me, yes, you can hold these, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing it because I don't want to ever take decisions yeah. based on what's in my portfolio, right? I want to make sure that those decisions are being taken, um, you know, for what I think is best from a policy perspective. You know, it's really interesting because you speak to this sort of impartiality element of it, while I've, I've heard with even other agencies, I, I believe the Treasury, you cannot hold if you're going to be making decisions. So it almost invites people who are against the technology or against these assets. So, um, so I have that concern. I mean, I think you're raising a really important point because I think what you do end up attracting is people who don't have any experience with these things. And I, and I, I think that has not been particularly helpful for me either that I haven't had direct experience. But at the same time, I think that the impartiality point for me is so important because I have tried so hard for the for, for us to open the doors in a way that I think is, is better for, for America. Yeah. Um, and so right. I, I just I want it to be driven solely by that policy goal. Right. You're and you're speaking to the that core principle of freedom, uh, self-determination, free market principles that Bitcoin is built on. Um, as we wrap up, I, I normally start with this question, but I, I would love to just get to know a little bit more about you uh, before we, we we close up this conversation. Just maybe a little on your background and or origin story. I know you um, started at the SEC as a commissioner in 2018, appointed by former President Donald Trump. But anything else you can share just for us to get to know you better? Yeah, well, I, I grew up in Ohio and I studied economics as a, in college and then went on to law school um, and, and ended up at the SEC as a staff attorney relatively early in my career. That was not the career path that I would have written for myself. Um, I, I certainly didn't, didn't think I would end up working for the government um, for as many years as, as I have. Um, but you know, I think as with anything else, you kind of go where interesting things take you. And um, I've always had really interesting jobs. And this one is interesting as well. Um, but I, I also think that my term ends in, in June of, of 2025. And I think that um, it'll be interesting to see who takes my spot. And I'm really enthusiastic to hear a new voice. Well, it's going to be an interesting year and a half ahead. Um, any final thoughts? I just thank you for, for taking the time and thanks for your good questions. And, and I, I guess my one final thing I would say is that my door is always open. I love hearing from people who have different ideas about how I might approach my job. Um, so if you have suggestions or you have thoughts of what you would do if you were sitting in my seat, I'm all ears. Um, would love to hear from you. I often let people know when I'll be traveling to different cities. I'd be happy to meet you in your city. You don't have to come to me or we can do it virtually. So that's uh, that's my final pitch, Commissioner Purse at sec.gov. Well, thank you so much, Hester. I mean, it's it's such a pleasure to talk to someone like you. And I know that you're going to ease a lot of the the nerves that some of the members of this community have about uh, government representatives, government regulators. So thank you so, so much for your time. I'm going to have your information in the show notes. And I hope to talk to you again soon.